Hey, Club Scouts, it's Michael, and before we start the show, it's time for some overdue Patreon shoutouts. I want to thank everybody who has supported our Patreon page over www.patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club. Uh, this week, we are thanking a handful of people, including a celebrity guest. So here we go. Rachel Aldridge, thank you. Manuel J. Baca, thank you. URSF, thank you. Are you a Russian robot? I don't know. But uh, that's your name. URSF, all caps, if that's an acronym. I don't know about it. Bryce looked something up on the Urban Dictionary, and it got Nothing. quickly dirty. Um, <laughs> Karen Chavez, a very healthy donation. Thank you. Danica, just plain Danica, we thank you. And finally, I want to thank Rachel Bloom, star and co-creator of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, who is currently writing season four of the show and is clearly far too busy to be listening to these episodes. So she's just doing this out of the goodness of her heart. Um, or maybe or she's hooked or she's hooked or maybe because it's a veiled apology and uh, she's not writing much for me this <laughs> season this is making me feel better um, if you want to become uh, a patron if you want to hear your name uh, shout it out on the show and gain access to bonus episodes every month go to our Patreon website check it out we've got uh, amazing stuff up there and uh, we love you we thank you so much everybody and uh, now it's time for the show <laughs> it's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> What's that? Hello, yeah. hey, and awesome. welcome to Bigfoot Collectors Club, the podcast where we talk to celebrity guests about their personal paranormal history and share tales of high strangeness. I'm your host, Michael McMillan, and with me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson, and our trusty producer, Riley Bray. Hey, happy 4th of July, everybody. Yeah, fireworks. Oh my Woo. gosh, what have you been doing all day? Blowing some shit up, maybe? Hopefully. Whether you are red or blue, hunter or sasquatch, abductee or alien... <laughs> This is a time when all Americans can come together as one and celebrate our country's birth. Also, <laughs> keep in mind that binary thinking leads to tribalism, fear, and animosity. So stop looking at the world as only existing in dualities. If there are reptilian overlords running the world, you're playing right into their bullshit. Don't be do it. Be kind to your fellow Americans, everyone. Um, so while you are wa whether you are watching or setting off fireworks today, keep in mind that Bigfoot is American too. Mm -hmm. Well, except for the Canadian Bigfoot, but we love them as well. Um, despite some of the recent comments our president has made this summer, uh, <laughs> so light a fountain in his or her honor and enjoy a safe and happy Independence Day, everybody. And guess what? There's no guest today. There's no celebrity guest. It's just no. the Bigfoot boys. Mike and I are enough celebrity to to handle it all. Yeah. You ever think about that? You get two <laughs> celebrities every week on the show. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a celebrity. Yeah, in yeah. yeah, that's yeah, yeah. three. Yeah. That's that's three. Let's forget our that's third three. celebrity here. Totally. Amongst psychedelic rock circles. Yeah, um, yeah man. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> nope. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I'm I'm picturing whoever's listening to this is like snuck away from the family barbecue. They've had enough. And oh, they yeah. need a little escapism. Totally. So I'm sorry I yelled at you. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're like me, you just have enough earbuds in your in your in your ears <laughs> while you're there. <laughs> totally. They're hiding under a hood. Yep. Or one of those big cat in the hat hats that's like on the <laughs> right. Sims. Whatever. Uncle Frank. Uh, Bryce, what are your <laughs> what are your uh, Fourth of July traditions in oh. your family? What do you guys do? You know, we we always go see the fireworks. Um, we're we're not big meat eaters, so we don't do a lot of barbecuing. But we like to get together with either friends or family and okay and uh, hang. Maybe I'll wear some American socks or something. Uh, <laughs> that's about whoa. Well, look out! <laughs> <laughs> if I'm feeling crazy, uh, but yeah, no, that's about it. Really, not a. Maybe three American socks. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, how about you, man? I you know. uh, well, I grew up in the Midwest in Kansas, so we definitely would go to town, blowing things up. You throw and down. 
we would throw down when I was a kid. I'd always get out all the old action figures that I didn't want anymore, or like army guys. I'd buy a big pack of army guys. Oh and yeah. I would set up a huge war, and I'd get some black hat firecrackers, and I would just blow shit up all the. I mean, that was my. Fa- I mean, it was tame. It was like yeah. pretty tame. Well, but it I was can't fun. get the fireworks now, but I used to love doing that. I mean, I was all about that. Oh man, yeah. I still go back. My uh, Chris Garibaldi, the lead singer of Sun Eaters, who's been on uh, the show over on the Patreon. Yep. Uh, he uh, and his wife. Who's my sister? Uh, they always throw a big a uh, um, Fourth of July party usually every year, yeah. If they can, and he will go to um, oh man, what's the name of uh, do you? My nephew is sitting here with us. Do you know the name of the um, the fireworks place? There's dishonest. There's honest Don, honest Johns, and dishonest Don. And I think he and they're across oh, the street from great. each other. That's what it is. I'd be over the and, dishonest. Yeah, yeah I you think know he. I think he buys it from so dishonest <laughs> Don. Now, if I'm, I'm, if I'm misnaming uh, those uh, places, I'm sorry, but I believe that's what it is. And he'll come back with a huge box of fireworks. He'll and then he'll go out into their cul-de-sac, and they will. Uh, he'll wire electronic wiring. To all the fuses, he puts on a hard hat, and then he calls everybody outside, and then he just goes through and presses buttons and launches oh, wow. all of them. Very Chevy Chase. Um, national yeah, it is, it, it's quite the Chevy Chase display, Not, and they don't always go off as planned. <laughs> right. <but laughs> right. Sometimes we got to run in with a, with a lighter. Gosh. But it's a blast, and Fourth of July is actually one of my favorite holidays because I feel like it's always laid back. It's not high maintenance. No one has big expectations for like, you know, there's no like Thanksgiving dinner has to be perfect or I have to get just the right gifts for everybody. You can just kick it and chill, um, chill grill or um, grill some um, eggplant burgers. Hey, who want. doesn't love eggplant? Most people. Uh, Riley, what do you guys do? Well, I, I'm also uh, not a meat eater, but we do a big old vegan barbecue for 4th of July. Oh, I love is, that. It is a good old time. And it's not just eggplants, let me tell you. Right, right. <laughs> I we love used, that. There was a, it was really fun. One year I, I was in LA and we, we hiked up the hill across from the um, Hollywood Bowl and we sat under that giant illuminated cross and we watched the fireworks from the Hollywood Bowl from up there. That cool. was like that a poor man. Uh, Fourth of July party, but it was really fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of blowing stuff up, I remember I was talking about this to my son the other day. One of my favorite activities in the summertime was like, um, so I'd spend the summers in Reno with my dad, and when he was off at work, you know, I'd so I'd go out to the backyard, which he never took care of, so it was like this dungeon, and I would bring out. All- I like the little pieces we're getting of your father's <laughs> life in reno just over this lifespan of this podcast totally, totally. we've heard hoarder we've heard i know i feel bad reno. but hey i'm an i'm an honest guy no it's great um so i would set out all my like gi joes and even like in like the he-man castle gray school i'd set up like this whole military scene you know and like dig like little dirt path roads and then I was big into BB guns. I had like a few rifles and oh, a few yeah. like hand. And I would just so I'd bring out like my BB gun gun rack, and I would just <laughs> sit out there all day in like a lawn chair, and I would just <laughs> scope out these my, all my toys, and I would just fill them full of lead, man. And it was so much fun. That sounds awesome. There's there comes this <laughs> time so in great. a in a young man's life where he either uh, and we had all the best toys in the eighties. Yeah, and it sucks. But you either sell your stuff in a garage sale. <laughs> Or you shoot them. <laughs> or you burn it with a magnifying yeah. glass. Yeah. I mean, I melted so many figures. Totally. My buddy, uh, D- Dave Keith, friend of the show, who a dog just opened the door and walked in, everybody. <laughs> I swear to God, the door just opened and a dog walked in. It's amazing. He's dog a very man. smart dog. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we would, uh, Dave Keith, when we were kids, one day we got out a bunch of my G.I. Joes, set them up, got his brother's pellet gun, and we just shot him. And then the ones that we couldn't successfully break with yeah. the gun, we just got a hammer and started smashing them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And now I'm, I'm like, God, I would kill to have that collection Best back. Time, yeah. We didn't do all of them, but we did a bunch of them, including... Some rare, released in Europe, only figures that my mom and dad brought back from a trip. Oh, wow. And they had, like, different paint jobs, and I thought they were kind of weird looking after a while. So we sm- And now they're, like, worth more than any of the other ones that oh, I'm I had. Oh, sure, yeah. Hey, Kids, don't 
be assholes, keep your toys in good shape, and uh, don't break them. I always loved it when like one of the BBs would like lodge into their head or something, and like it was still in there. You'd be like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, just taking out one of his eyes. <laughs> totally shipwrecks. Uh, all. Um, the good times. So, guys, I thought uh, before we get into the, um, this is obviously not a traditional episode. This is a Fourth of July special. We're doing things a little differently today, and you'll find out what that is in a moment. But before we do that, I thought it would be fun. Mm. Uh, we started a new game this summer called Bullshit or Believe It. Right. And I thought it would be fun to play this game with you guys. <laughs> oh, no. <All> right. <laughs> and see what you believe in I or like what you... <laughs> for me, it'd be just like, select all, believe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Copy, paste. Copy, paste. Believe it. All. All right. Uh, um, so let me go through here um, while I'm doing that. Oh, here we go. Okay, I've got the list. Now, we can do this one of two ways. We can do it simultaneously, or we can do it individually. You know, I'm pretty serious. I've already, I've heard your game before, and there's like, I don't think there's one thing on there I don't believe. All right, well, let's try it. We'll start let's with, do it. we'll do Bryce first, do Bryce and we'll first. do Riley. Yeah, all right. yeah. And then uh, keep, if there's anything that bumps you, Riley, uh, we can we can check him, okay? So here we go, guys. This is the Bigfoot Collectors Club, Clubhouse edition of Bullshit or Believe It. Sweet. On your mark, get set. <laughs> Go. Ghosts. I believe it. Alien Greys. Yeah, definitely. Say you gotta say Oh, believe it. Angels. Uh believe it. Gnomes. Believe it. <laughs> JFK assassination <laughs> conspiracy. Definitely believe it. Yeti. Yeah, believe it. Unicorns. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there is the Norwal whale, which that's has not a, a, that's okay. a Norwal whale. All right, unicorn. unicorn of the sea. I, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Loch Ness monster. Uh, yeah, believe it. Parallel universes. For sure, believe it. Reptilians disguising themselves as humans. Uh, bullshit. Mermaids. Um. Like today, do they exist today, or can they be in the past? Believe it. <laughs> oh boy! Oh, the true purpose of this game has been has now revealed itself. <laughs> Woo! Heaven uh, is a place on Earth. Believe it. Hell is a place on Earth. Believe it. Dragons. Uh, <laughs> Now oh I want to be God. like Medusa. Uh, <laughs> uh, dragons. Uh, yeah, believe it. Sure. Medusa. Believe it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I could expand on all these answers, but I'm choosing not to. Chewbacca. Chewbacca. I just saw him last weekend. He was great. Bullshit, Chewbacca. <laughs> well, he's really a Bigfoot anyway, so believe it. Elves. <laughs> Uh, believe it. I knew we'd find some way to justify it. Uh, ESP. Believe it. Demons. Believe it. Atlantis. Believe it. Faith in your career. Don't believe it. Oh, Bullshit. Come on, oh come God. On. Oh, okay. I believe it for oh, you guys. Oh, God. You can believe in mermaids, but you can't believe in your own career. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, um, so you think mermaids actually existed at one point? Like humans with fish tails. Um, Listen, I'm not mocking you. I want to get to the bottom of God, this. God, yeah. You know, that's a. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I, b I believe a case can be made for mermaids. Really? Sure. What makes you say that? Um, <laughs> I don't want to make that case now. This is I'm like when prepared. John Lennon and Paul McCartney <laughs> broke up. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. No, 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 I'm teasing, I'm teasing, yeah. of course. Does that make me George? Yeah, you're definitely uh, yeah. George. Yes. We don't oh, yeah. have a Ringo. There's no Ringo. There's no Ringo. Nova the Nova's dog. a Ringo. Maybe my nephew's wow. Ringo. I don't want to alienate my mermaid believers out there. So, But unicorns are bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you starting to get in my I head really now? love that you... <laughs> <laughs> it's a dark I love place. that you really had to stop and think about it. Listen, I made the list. I'm asking these questions, so I can't list. really judge. It's true. Um, interesting that mm. you think reptilians disguising themselves as humans is bullshit you don't believe in the anunnaki or the oh i believe in the anunnaki but i don't okay. believe in themselves like i don't i don't believe in the uh the reptilian thing like like the news anchor and like oh her, her eye right. shifted yeah, 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 she's yeah, a reptilian yeah. i don't yeah. believe that 
Got it. That's interesting because you're pretty big on all the UFO stuff. Yeah. Oh, big time for sure. And I believe in uh, a reptilian race of uh, of aliens, but uh, right. You know, I don't believe they're uh, walking amongst us. Now, okay. So let me ask you this then: mm. if if um, if there are such now, mermaids. things, yeah, <laughs> there are such things. <laughs> mermaids. Are mermaids walking amongst us? Oh my god! You know they have to trade their voice for that. Do you remember that Discovery on Discovery TV? They yeah, came you've out brought that. this up in anger before. I know that was like, <laughs> I know they did. I was like, I wanted to believe so bad. Their footage was so cool, but I just like something about it was like. But here I am something saying something about I, it being the fact that it was fiction. You know, <laughs> I, I something I can't put my finger on. Yes, yeah, just can't put <laughs> quite put my finger on it. I mean, listen, I believe if okay, so if if Bigfoot can can come out of a parallel universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in the Pacific Northwest, then why couldn't a mer- mermaid or a merman come out of a parallel universe from the, the depths of the ocean? Fair enough. You know? Okay. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Sure. Uh, back to the reptilians. Okay. If there are reptilian aliens and they've made it all the way here, what's stopping them from just shape-shifting and then, and, and then and disguising themselves? I'm playing devil's advocate here. Sure. Disguising themselves. I mean, like... If they're here, what are they here for? Why can't it be to uh, secretly run our government? Oh, yeah. You know, okay. You might have swayed me a little bit. Don't, um, don't let that sway you. That was a terrible <laughs> argument. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm really... You're very impressionable. I'm really open to anything. I'm an open-minded guy. <laughs> That's why the internet I'm is like my worst enemy. Sometimes when I hear... Yeah. Sometimes when I hear these like real heavy alien conspiracy stuff that i tend to you know my problem with it is and listen i make no bones about it yeah. i am i i feel like uh in the past couple of years conspiracy theories have stopped being fun yeah totally. and i feel like they have uh they all sort of boil down to at the end of the day uh <clears throat> animosity towards certain races of people that's mm. what it always comes down to that uh you can put a uh, an alien in as a metaphor for uh you know something else yeah, you that's know very psychological so sure. so anyway i always but, felt but, that- but 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 the thing that my point was to think sorry <clears throat> the thing the thing that i do have to stop and think about is like okay if there are aliens coming here mm-hmm. and i do believe that yeah, I really do. Me too. Then what's the narrative there, and what are they doing? Who's to say that they aren't getting involved in a way that would not make me feel very comfortable? Mm-hmm. However, I just... It's weird. I don't know why I draw the line where I draw the line, but I just... Right. I guess it's because a lot of the people who are giving that information to the public, I feel are... Uh, and I say... Are 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 uh, have bad intentions? Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, listen, I've always been kind of curious as to like the 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 lizard people, the draconian aspect of things. But I, you know, you said the Anunnaki. I've always taken them as more of kind of an offshoot of uh, some sort of a related to Egyptian and Atlantis. And I thought the Anunnaki know. were the reptilians. Um, I mean, nobody knows. right? Well, you know what? We got to re- we'll 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 do a future reptilian. Yeah, episode we'll do a future for, one. Eh. <laughs> okay, and then we'll see. Uh, I'll convince you then. <laughs> that shouldn't be hard. <laughs> all right. Oh, gnomes. So you're all about gnomes. Yeah. You're I all about gnomes. elves. Yeah. Okay. Yep. What are the uh, What's the difference between a gnome and an elf? Uh, well, elf, a gnome, and an elf. That's, that's... in your mind. Oh God. <laughs> in reality, how to make Bryce sound <laughs> like a total idiot? Uh, I, you know, gnomes to me, elves are like elfin, right? They can like also be like. I, th- I believe like elves are related more to fairies, like uh, yeah. Uh, whereas gnomes like are more like woodland creatures, okay. Uh, and they can be more um, uh, malevolent, or perhaps. Uh, where elves, to me, you know, seem to be, you know, I'd have to like look back at the old Celtic and Scottish lore to kind of help right. myself differentiate. <laughs> um, but I, I should add fairies to this list. Yeah, and I would, and I do believe in that, in that as well, um, um, as well as Medusa. Yeah, so <laughs> where's the all in button? <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> this is me moving Max my bet. chips uh, <laughs> into the center of the table. <laughs> all right, well, we are as promised, we will be doing an episode on gnomes in the near future, so stay tuned. Yeah, I think for there's a that. lot of good evidence there. Okay, now, Riley, 
All right. We're doing the same thing. Let's do this. Get him, Riley. On your mark, get set, go. Ghosts. Believe it. Alien greys. Definitely believe it. Angels. Don't like the term. It seems more like Rapid a metaphor. Rapid fire. So we b- can come bullshit. Back. Bullshit. Gnomes. Bullshit. JFK assa- assassination. Believe it. Okay. Yeah. Yeti. Uh, before the podcast, bullshit. Now, believe it. Nice. Fairies. Uh, bullshit. Unicorns. Bullshit. Loch Ness Monster. Uh, bullshit. Parallel universes. Definitely believe it. Reptilians disguising themselves as humans. <sighs> bullshit. But mermaids. <sighs> bullshit. Riley. Heaven. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. With angels. My bullshit. mother was a mermaid. <laughs> bullshit. Uh, hell. Bullshit. Dragons. <sighs> Unfortunately, bullshit. Elves. Same. Bullshit. ESP. Definitely believe it. Demons. Bullshit. Atlantis. Believe it. Yeah. Rock and roll. Believe it till I die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, all right. <clears throat> so Loch Ness Monster's bullshit. I think it is, but I love Riley, it. I love or, this story. Bryce doesn't believe in it either. He said believe it, but he doesn't. I know. I didn't want to offend you. I mean, you I, know, I knew. <laughs> I know when you're lying. The, 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 the Nessie always seemed like a little. You know what? But I do believe it, though. After your you, now, you, let me ask you this, Mister Johnson: <laughs> <laughs> If Sasquatch can enter a portal in a forest, why can't Nessie enter a portal in a lake? No, you know what? After doing the research uh, on on the lake monsters, and then. And then seeing that stuff, uh, I, I do believe that there is something in uh, in Loch Ness. I think it could be a very large catfish. I mean, look, yeah. I think something is in there. Right. I think there is some kind of animal in there. It may not be a plesiosaur, but yeah. there's something, or it w- at least once was. I just believe it's all, that that, that even that is part of the paranormal. Like it, like people often say, well, there's not enough food to, to for a family of Loch Nesses to survive there. Well, I'm like... You know, well, it depends on what the observer saw and then, you know, what kind of... Well, and one of them... Uh, it's an event. It's an occurrence. It's a happening. Uh, what Wasn't one of the... Uh, I don't think we included this on our episode with Craig Ferguson. <laughs> Go back and listen to it. But um, uh, <laughs> wasn't didn't, didn't the Loch Ness Monster eat a guy's sheep? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so they're coming out of the water. I mean, there are numerous... Accounts oh, yeah. of it coming out of the water and getting stuff. Well, and that's like in the Bigfoot. Like you know, you often hear of times of like you know, deer's heads will be like you know, ripped off or something. It's, so it obviously can you know eat flesh and like leave physical footprints and yeah, and you know, so it it, it can it can feast here in this dimension in our world, but it certainly doesn't have to live, uh, it, you know, its entire life in this dimension. Right, you know? Riley. It's just with with Bigfoot, like it's on every continent. Like, there's so many accounts. Like, the Loch Ness is just so specific. There's just this, like, one plesiosaur that I'm like, uh, it's fun. I'm never going to stop believing in Nessie. I want to believe it. Don't. But I just can't. See, that's what I feel. Like, you're you're like in the world of, like, linking it to to old dinosaurs. Just like where, like, most of the Bigfoot world is linking it to, like, some, like, missing link of, like, on the, on the, you know... Um, the the ape to human chain, you know. And yeah. I, I just don't believe that it that it lives in that area. I yeah. Okay, but I'm real into the portals. I right. gotta say, yeah. Big, big big on portals, and I think that there's spaces on Earth that are sort of interdimensional hot spots. Highly active for sure. I don't know for some reason though the uh, the 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 Sasquatch walking through the portal. Just the, I don't know the plesiosaur sized portal seems yeah. uh, excessive to me. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> right. I I, I, I set totally. my portal height hey, at ten feet max. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Plus, we did provide a picture of a bigfoot like creature coming out of a portal on our Skinwalker Ranch episode. True. So true. Uh, a little photographic evidence can go a long way. I saw a cool illustration this week of a bigfoot merging out of a portal, and I forgot to send it to you. I don't know, <sighs> and I apologize. Man. Love that stuff. I'm gonna make you a cake. Your birthday cake is gonna have a Bigfoot coming out of a portal. I'm sure my wife will be pleased. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his wife now. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to have a double high strangeness that is presidential themed just in time for the 4th of July. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Well, hold on now, Michael. Before that break, did you want me to hit you off with the uh, Bullshit or Believe It quiz? Oh. I mean, I think our fans would feel right. remiss. All right. I mean, I didn't even think about this, but that's a good idea. Yeah. Let's a taste you of up. his own medicine. Yeah, have a little taste of your own medicine here. Great. Watch, watch and learn how a rapid fire is done. Ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Believe it. Alien Grays. Believe it. Angels. Believe it. Gnomes. Bullshit. JFK assassination. Believe it. Yeti. Believe it. Fairies. Bullshit. Unicorns. Bullshit. Loch Ness Monster. Believe it. Parallel universes. Believe it. Reptilians disguising themselves as humans. Bullshit. Mermaids. Bullshit. Heaven. Bullshit. Hell. Bullshit. Dragons. Bullshit. Elves. Bullshit. Fairies. Bullshit. ESP. Believe it. Demons. Believe it. Atlantis. Bullshit. Faith in Bryce's career. Believe it. Oh. <laughs> well done. That, well that done. was rapid that was fire. Nice. That was good. Uh... Tricky because I said I don't believe in hell, but I do believe in demons. Notice that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's interesting. I, I I guess I don't believe in heaven and hell in terms of the traditional sense. Yeah. I do think that there are higher planes, higher and lower realms of existence beyond the one that we live in. Yeah. That I, we do have access to after we die. So is there a version, uh, is there an adaptation of hell Sure, but I but I'm like you, Bryce. I kind of believe yeah. a lot of that stuff is here on Earth. Uh, on I, Earth I feel like hell and heaven he- are state of mind. Yeah, right in that prayer. On Earth as it is in heaven, yeah. I believe people can put themselves in through hell here on Earth, and I believe people can also experience heaven like things or qualities or feelings and emotions here on Earth. I mean, there's uh, you know, this is the place. It's not some place that you're going to go to. Um, this is it. This is the here and now. You know yeah. all those. I like uh, that. I like that perspective. And yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an amendment. I do believe in. I don't believe in winged like angel from the X Men comics angels, mm-hmm. but I do think that there are higher dimensional beings that we've interpreted as angels. Well, that's this, what I was getting at too. I just don't like the yeah. I don't like the terminology. I don't like the framework. If you'd said light beings, yeah. right, I would have been all over that. Sure. Totally. But, yeah, uh, but, right. but this is why we do the game so then we can have our reaction to it and then unpack it a little bit here and here and there. Well, this will be a great segue because our very first president was visited by an angelic being. Ha, say what? President Trump, he's the first <laughs> president I've recognized. <laughs> we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Hey, everyone. This is Riley. I wanted to let you know we've launched our Patreon page. It's a place where listeners can help support the show and gain access to exclusive bonus content. For $5 a month, our Patreon members get special episodes like our Campfire Stories, Movie Club, and Out There episodes, where we explore our own little place in the cosmos. We also post behind-the-scenes conversations that happen during the breaks and all sorts of other bonuses. We put a lot of love into these episodes, and we make a lot of them. They're a deeper level of the show where we expand on ideas and concepts from our main feed. Our weekly show will, of course, always remain free, but for $5 a month, our Patreon members will gain full access to the inner sanctum of the BCC. We hope you'll join us there. That's patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club. And thanks for listening. Boy, it really is a 4th of July celebration here. We got vegan burgers on the grill. I know, man. That was awesome. Cooking yeah. uh, it up. We were grilling. We're having a good time. Uh, <laughs> my nephew's in town visiting quietly on the floor. He's got some pillows. He's chill. Yeah. Yep, he's nodding. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Well, now it is time for high strangeness. And what Bryce and I decided to do is we're both going to go today and we're going to tell stories of the paranormal that involve U.S. presidents. Yeah, that's right. The commander in chief. And there are plenty out there. This is just the first edition. So if we leave out your favorite Lincoln ghost story, too bad. Maybe we'll do it next summer. Mm hmm. All right. Bryce, now you decided you want to go first. Sure. Let's start right, at the let's beginning. Let's do it. Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, winter 1777, the height of the Revolutionary War. Mermaids have just been destroyed by the Redcoats. <laughs> the Merman, the last of the Merman, fought for America's independence. George Washington oh, gave King Triton the medal, the U.S. Medal of Honor. God, why couldn't he have seen a mermaid? Oh, uh, oh well. So General George Washington was a little bit demoralized at the state of his troops, and he decided... We're not going to be able to get through this without dropping We more. have to. We okay, no more mermaid to. references. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and so he went into the forest... This is uh, Washington. This is George G-dubs. Washington to pray, and he saw what can only be described as an otherworldly phenomenon. 
Now, it, it was reported in the 1880 National Tribune by a guy named uh, Anthony Sherman, I believe was his name. And he reported an account from one of Washington's uh, men. That was him. The soldier reports that Washington was approached by a strange being in the woods. And according to the story, the being showed Washington a map of America on it. And on it fell drops of water with each drops of water. Now, actually, to, to get more into detail. Yes, please. The, uh, the being ocean showed, water drops. Yeah, it took drops of water Michael. from the ocean, and then there was more of a kind of a, a, a darker figure, like a demonic figure, uh, uh, putting drops of the water onto the city. So it was a different okay. creature, according to the Tribune. Okay, I'm sorry, we we started off so silly here. Yeah, just reset the stage for us. We're at Valley. This is when. Yeah, no. So this is the winter of 1777, okay. Valley Forge, Washington's he, alone in a forest. Okay. Now he relayed this back to one of his one of his men, which uh, who then reported it to. Uh, in the 1880 National Tribune. Okay. You know, why don't I just go ahead and read a little bit from Please that do. story. That's um, what we want to hear. You know, just go right to the source. Um, and, and this is as follows. This, George Washington's vision. This afternoon, as I was sitting at this table, engaged in preparing a dispatch, something seemed to disturb me. Looking up, I beheld the standing opposite me, a singularly beautiful female. So astonished was I for I had given strict orders not to be disturbed, that it was some moments before I found language to inquire the cause of her presence. A second, a third, and even a fourth time did I repeat my question, but received no answer from my mysterious visitor except a slight raising of her eyes. And this is where I kind of like it in these next two little paragraphs. I said, no hot I women, said. <laughs> do not disturb me, I don't care how beautiful she is. But now listen to how he describes this. By this time I felt strange sensations spreading through me. I would have risen, but the riveted gaze of the being forced be- before me rendered volition impossible. I essayed once more to address her, but my tongue had become useless as though it had become paralyzed. A new influence, mysterious, potent, irresistible took possession of me all i could do was to gaze steadily vacantly at my unknown visitor gradually the surrounding atmosphere seemed as if it had become filled with sensations and luminous everything about me seemed to rarefy the mysterious visitor herself becoming more airy and yet more distinct to my sight than before I now began to feel as one dying, or rather to experience the sensations which I have sometimes imagined accompany dissolution. So it's almost like he's experiencing this near-death experience. Um, this or, also sounds like a DMT trip. Yeah, it really like, does. It's an, like an psych- altered state of consciousness. But this was an encounter, and he, you know, he he describes it as this beautiful angelic being. And those are his those are his actual words. There. This this is relayed by Andrew uh, Anthony Sherman is the one who wrote this article. Uh, to the National Tribune, but it was relayed directly he's to quoting, him. He's quoting Washington as he took it in a journal. Wow. You know, so these are some relatively Washington's words. Wow. Uh, Dude, relayed there's to so much weird stuff the presidents have seen and done. I mean, obviously, yeah. but also like <laughs> well, this story, I've never even heard this story. It's incredible. And this is just one encounter, right? So there, uh, he also has, which I think is you'll find even more interesting, is he also has... Presidents this, are the biggest weirdos of them all. They really are. Now, I he mean, has a... He has a UFO encounter, too. Um, Wait, go on. What happened with this? Oh, right. So, like I said, uh, okay, to kind of... And then, you know, the the angel says, you know, son of the Republic, some mysterious voices before, look and learn. At that moment, I beheld a dark, shadowy being, like an angel, standing or rather floating in midair between Europe and America, dipping water out of the ocean in the hollow of each land. He sprinkled some upon America with his right hand, while with his left hand he cast some on Europe. Immediately a cloud raised from these countries and joined in mid-ocean. So so I just wanted to differentiate that he's seeing two beings here. There's this kind of like angelic, beautiful lady, and then as he gets his premonition or his prophecy, it becomes more of kind of a dark, shadowy being. And, you know, he picks water from the ocean and he drops it on this map of America where all the major cities would be. And uh, and I believe it goes on to say, like, he gets this vision of union, you know, across uh, the shadowy uh, figure's head. So it's a a prophetic vision, to say the least. Do you think that he now, do you think that, like, Washington could have been going in, you said to pray, but do you think maybe he was, like, 
taking mushrooms. Yeah. Or, I mean, who knows? Who freaking knows? I mean, wh- I don't know. Whatever incurred his uh, or her his altered state of consciousness, or or they knew it was one of those moments in history that was so important, and uh, you know, he sought solace at a heightened emotion, uh-huh. you know, and and these beings came forth to okay. him. Obviously, he was a pretty significant, you know, figure in uh, in modern history. But you know, I want to. So wait. Ju- so what happened after that? Before we jump. So that was it. You know, he gets his vision. He gets his vision of a of a of a unionized America, and which really kind of uh, em- emboldened and emblazoned him to go and and uh, and rally his troops, which he did, and they go on to you know uh, as the underdogs to win Super Bowl fifty seven. Win Super Bowl fifty seven. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I know this I'm kind takes of, place in the future. <laughs> I'm kind of jumping forward Wait, because when, what Super Bowl? Now are we the on? second vision he had at Valley Forge was even stranger than that washington said um that what he saw in the forest oh so he has this other vision of uh and i'm going to kind of read out of uh this was uh just called george washington in the greenies and this is by basil hill for sun magazine but it's an incredible article. Now, amazing new revelations in George Washington's war diary, he kept two diaries, suggest that the father of the country powwowed with space aliens, thinking they were yet another tribe of exotic and remote Indians. What set alarm bells ringing in is a diary reference to a glowing round craft in the snowy woods behind Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where the first commander-in-chief wintered with his bedraggled Continental Army. Daybook. Ironically, the news comes from a British historian who may have access to captured documents that Americans have never seen. Quentin Byrd of Edinburgh believes he has several pages of the Daybook, the general dictator... Edinburgh? Edinburgh? Edinburgh, yes. Believes he has several pages of the Daybook the general dictated to his military secretary nearly every day. The rub is that just when things get really interesting, there's a gap of a page or two, says the independent Scots historian, which makes me want to know what's on those two pages. But I'll, I'll read on. Glowing Globe. A reference to the glowing craft may clarify also Washington's... Also the uh, first pitch name for the Golden Globes. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, a reference to the, yeah. to the glowing craft may clarify Washington's later reference to green-skinned Indians, or greenskins, as the commander sometimes called them. Until now, historians have assumed Washington was Told referring. Told you this stuff gets racist. Yeah, <laughs> like was re- alien racial slur. Was there. referring to a tribe that used green war paint, says Bird, who specializes in researching points in history where he believes space aliens have intervened in human events. Now, Bird believes the Greenskins were space aliens who supplied Washington with wise advice, information about British troop movements and tactics, and perhaps even some superior technology that helped him win the war. Lasers. Lasers. Whoever they were, Washington very much looked forward to his rare meetings with the Greenskins, who lived in a glowing globe in the woods. Now, the usual interpretation is that the glowing globe was a rounded lodge made of animal skins that glowed from the firelight inside. But Bird's discovery of references to a hovering and disappearing globe leads him to believe the glowing lodge was really a spacecraft. It's also strange that sometimes the globe is behind Washington's headquarters and sometimes it's not, notes Bird. An Indian Lodge is either there or it's not. This thing came and went, which is entirely consistent with a spacecraft that pays occasional visits. Bird also believes there is a crucial evidence yet to surface and he is scrambling to find the missing parts of the war diary. The pages were captured by the British and languished for years in an Edinburgh archive. Um, the diary's importance was missed by historians when it did not when it surfaced because it wasn't in Washington's handwriting. Bird's ex- explanation is that for his simple. Washington often dictated, he claims. He had a military secretary, my great 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 grandfather, a Lieutenant Johnson, at the time of these pages. Of okay, starting to sound a little manic there, Mr. Bird. <laughs> Wait, uh, do you mean Edinburgh? Is it in Edinburgh. Scotland? Yes, Edinburgh. Yes. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay, this guy's a, he was a Scots yeah, uh, Edinburgh. a Scott historian. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um wow. I know, Weird. I, I also like I get it, so excited. I also like the idea of a UFO made out of like animal skins. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Again, if we're going back to this theory that like they appear of the technology of the time or sure. of the you know, I don't know. It's kind of yeah. cool. Well, that's how he's also saying that's how people who kind of glossed over these pages in this war diary take it. Oh, he must be referring to an animal skin lodge or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, and even how Washington kind of uh 
uh, asserted that oh, it was a it was an ex- ex- exotic tribe of Indians. Well, you know maybe there mean? were like uh, natives that uh, had some sort of green body paint on them. I, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, check uh, it out. hovering is in quotes and glowing. I mean, this just reeks of like of UFO encounter. You know, dude. So okay, idea for a movie. This is mine. The Revenant, but with aliens. <sighs> yeah, that would be yeah. awesome. Ticket bought. <laughs> Sold one seat. Yeah, I'd watch that. That would be badass. <laughs> yeah, dude. Maybe there's could be a mermaid in there. Also, the Redskins <laughs> should rename the team name to the Washington Lasers. That one's Washington a freebie. Lasers. That one's a freebie. <laughs> so solving that's, problems. Solving problems. So that's Washington and his kind of... Uh, you know, I mean, two accounts like that, that's pretty crazy. I've never heard any of that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, what else you got? Keep it going. Okay. Uh, let's move uh, I'm on excited. to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This now, one is this definitely is, getting a rise <clears throat> out of me. According to a published account on April 5th, uh, in 1800, President Thomas Jefferson and his aide, William Dunbar, witnessed something unexplainable fly above their heads and crash to the earth. The UFO was about 70 to 80 feet long, as it was reported, flying about 200 yards off the surface of the earth. It was the size of a giant snuff box. It was the size of a house, (laughs) they say, and crimson red. It passed over them for about 15 to 20 seconds, and it disappeared behind a hill where they heard a large crash and felt a rumble on the ground. Now, whatever it was, definitely crashed because upon investigation, Jefferson learned that the surface of the earth was broken up and badly scorched. Whoa, radioactive President Jefferson. I know. So first uh, alien spacecraft crash retrieval by a president, perhaps. Um, Was that... What did they find? They didn't find the craft It doesn't say they didn't find anything. They really just found scorched earth and burn marks. Maybe a meteor? Uh, Michael... That one does sound a little meteor. That one sounds yeah. a bit like a meteor. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. How about a mermeer? Well, um, a passed o- it says passed over them the for ocean. about 15 to 20 seconds before disappearing behind the hill. So that's a long time. I mean, time. that's a long and time. And you know what? Okay. Back then, the hill was a just so, f- it was such a long walk. Why go? <laughs> well, and I'm sure they had seen uh, meteorites before and stuff like that, or, or you know, stuff like that. So I'm sure of if, if he wanted to describe what he saw as a meteor, he would have done that, you know, a falling you know, thing from the sky, but this seems to allude to something more ominous. Also the size of it. I mean, no one's going to say a meteor was the size of a house. That would right. do some real yeah. damage. That's and like, glowing uh, crimson red, you know? Yeah. That's like, uh, uh, what's the area? And um, I mean, a meteor the size of a house crash, that would wipe, that would yeah decimate. There's not a that lot area. on that account. So that one's pretty much all that one has, but I felt it was interesting and certainly pertinent to our, what we were discussing Super today. Super cool. Yeah. Um, what do you got? No, let's keep going. We'll, we'll, we'll take a break and come back to me. I want to hear the rest of your, your, your presidential stuff, your UFO stuff. You have more, don't you? Oh, I have more. Um, let's yeah, well, I thought we were going to go in, uh, no, no. <laughs> no, this is good. Okay. I'm too into this. All right. Moving on. Um, who else do we have? Well, you know, there was a lot of presidents. And then I, I want to kind of fast I always forward. The one that I always heard was Jimmy Carter. Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. Carter had seen a UFO. Yeah, let's discuss Jimmy Carter. On September 18th, 1973, future president Jimmy Carter, he files a report with the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, claiming he had seen an unidentified flying object in October of 1969. During the presidential campaign of 1976, Democratic challenger Carter was forthcoming about his belief that he had seen a UFO. He describes waiting outside for a Lions Club meeting in Leary, Georgia to begin at about 7.30 p.m. when he spotted what he called the darndest thing I've ever seen in the sky. Carter, as well as 10 to 12 other people who witnessed the same event, described the object as very bright with changing colors and about the size of the moon. Carter reported that the object hovered about 30 degrees above the horizon and moved in toward the earth and away before disappearing into the distance. He later told a reporter that after the experience, he vowed never again to ridicule anyone who claimed to have seen a UFO. 
He gets it. Yeah, he Man, gets it. I love it. Jimmy Carter. Yeah, he was great. The peanut farmer from Georgia. Yeah. But, uh, was that in Georgia where he witnessed that? Yeah, that's right. In uh, in Leary, Georgia, outside oh, of cool. a Lions Club meeting. And he saw it with the 10 to 12 other members who, who witnessed the, the same thing. The multiple witnesses. That's a classic. I mean, that's verifiable. Dude, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, totally. And he went so far as to report it to NICAP to make an official reporting. So I, I believe he's the only president to have done so, uh, you know. But uh, I, I think that uh, holds some heavy water there. Uh, so that's Jimmy Carter's sighting. And then um, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if you're familiar with Ronald Reagan, who also had a few. Who's with that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, what I meant to say is familiar with Ronald Reagan's UFO sightings. I, I'm not. No. Really? Lay it on us. Oh, my God. You'll love this then. Um, this is a really wonderful way to honor our country today, I feel like. Yeah. Too. No, absolutely. So President Ronald Reagan had two um, UFO sightings. Um, the first one was, uh, he was on his way to a Hollywood dinner party. Uh, Lucille Ball was there and, uh, you know, they, him and Nancy Reagan were late. And, um, according to, cause Lucille Ball wrote, wrote a book, I believe, uh, called Lucy in the afternoon. Oh, I have heard this story. And, and which in, in, cool. in the event where she describes that the, uh, that the Reagans had came into the party late and they were kind of aghast and, you know, they were, they looked a little pale faced and, uh. And uh, she said, what's wrong? You know, and they're like, you know, Nancy and I, we just witnessed a UFO, you know, on our way down from Bakersfield. So they had seen something in the sky that kind of shook them up and they both saw it. Um, that's really all there is on that one. But now his second UFO sighting uh, has a little bit more information to it. The second UFO sighting Ronald Reagan was eyewitness to happened in 1974 while he was still governor of California. Um, you know, he was also the president of SAG at one point. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah. Um, so just one. And now Andrea from 90210 yes. is our current. That's right. So maybe she'll be president one day too. You never know. She's got to be governor first and she's got to see two UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> so just one week after witnessing the sighting, he told the story to Norman C. Miller, who was the Washington bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal and later became the editor of LA Times. Reagan stated to him, I love this, I was in a plane um, last week when I looked out the window and I saw this white light. It was zigzagging around. I went up to the pilot and said, have you seen anything like that before? He was shocked and said, nope. And I said to him, let's follow it. Who followed it for several minutes. Uh, I noticed you're enjoying my Reagan. Really? Uh, <laughs> really you are good. now just going to have to, I want to host this show with Ronald Reagan. <laughs> well, I'm really glad. It was, it was a bright white light. We followed it to Bakersfield. And all of a sudden, to our utter amazement, it went straight up into the heavens. When we got off the plane, I told Nancy all about it. The pilot of Reagan's plane at the time was Bill Paytner, and he backed up Reagan's version of the UFO sighting. He stated, I was the pilot of the plane when we saw the UFO. Also, on board were Governor Reagan and a couple of his security people. We were flying a Cessna Citation. It was maybe 9 or 10 o'clock at night. We were near Bakersfield when Governor Reagan and the others called my attention to a big light flying a bit behind the Again, plane. Again, near Bakersfield. Yeah. It appeared to be several hundred yards away. It was fairly steady light until it began to accelerate. Then it appeared to elongate... So a shape-shifting UFO here again, which cool. we've seen from those uh, gun cameras released by Tom DeLonge's uh, Academy to the Stars. Right. Uh, the light took off. It went up at a 45-degree angle at a high rate of speed. Everyone on the plane was surprised. Governor, Ra Governor Reagan expressed amazement. I'll do that. Oh, my. That was amazing. Um, I told the others I didn't know what it was. The UFO went from a normal cruise speed to a fantastic speed instantly. Um, and that is the story of Ronald Reagan's UFO. So I love that he was like, follow that thing. <laughs> totally. That's the best part that's of that story. <laughs> <laughs> the pilot's like, yeah, all right. Sounds yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, oh, and, and, and then, so Reagan goes on, uh, to speak at the United Nations and gives that stellar speech. Do you recall this where he says, um, let me find it. I know what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? And that was President Ronald Reagan addressing the United Nations General Assembly, 1987. 
Now, they tried to take that little bit of the speech out, and they gave him his edited draft. Here's the speech. What do you think? And uh, and it's interesting. He, he writes in his own handwriting, I think there's too much anti-Soviet preaching in view of what we're trying to achieve right now. And and uh, and toward the uh, and toward the end, perhaps I still would like my in quotes fantasy. How quickly our differences would unite, would vanish, if creatures from outer space uh, should threaten this world. Sir, sir, signed R R. Sir, it's beautiful, but we do not want to spoil um, spoil now the you ending here, to God Watchmen. Damn, we're putting back in the Watchmen alien thing. is it's a it's well, a that's fantastic. <laughs> it is, it's a national treasure. It's yeah, not, we can't spoil. And the on his own personal note, he writes this little scribble, which symbologists say is representative of the serpent. So, um, also Whoa. very mysterious uh, in his own personal handwriting notes. As you can see that there. So obviously what I mean, he saw in that sky affected him tremendously. And he wanted, and he brought that 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 to his famous speech, which I always like, I always responded to that because I was like, you know, I wasn't a, the biggest Reagan f- fan per se. I was pretty young, but at the same time, I was like, what he's saying there is so true. How quickly our differences would just fall to the wayside Mm -hmm. if some alien threat, you know, threatened our world. And and I, you know, it says, um, I got a a little bit of more information on the, uh, the first sighting. Mm. It was William Holden's party. Lucille Ball was there. Right. And it was, it said that they were coming down the coastal highway and stopped and got out of the car to watch it. Oh, wow. And, um, it says, this is from a website, um, (laughs) just a website. Called presidentialufo.com. Yeah, yeah, it checks um, out. Some unconfirmed stories of the event stated that the object actually landed. Oh wow! Lucy, in her account of the event, stated, "After he elected president, I kept thinking about that event and wondered if he would still have won if he told everyone that he saw a flying saucer." Yeah, right. That's great. Uh, he would have gotten my vote. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Hell yeah! Thanks, weird guy in the corner. Hell yeah! And so I'll just leave you with one more. I mean, yes. you know, there is some. Um, some JFK alien stuff, but that gets a little. And we're not even getting into uh, Truman's meeting with the aliens. You know what? I, I we I, got that. We that's a whole I, other story. I purposely left out um, the post presidents of Roswell, which is Truman, the start of the Majestic Twelve, and then Dwight D. Dude, Eisenhower's we're going to beware do, of the indu- 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 the military industrial complex. You know what that's I think we should speech. do? Yeah. You know yeah. what I think we should do in September? Is do well? I guess it's July already. We need to talk about this sometime soon. We should do a whole Roswell month. Well, where we cover yeah, Roswell. We have not covered Roswell. We yet. cover post Roswell. We cover the Majestic Twelve and Project Serpo. Because let me tell you something. That's Dude, where it Serpo gets. Is that's the where shaz. information starts flooding in. That's where. Um, that's where the military becomes highly involved, and you start and and all the the players really start coming on board. Um, you know, I mean, the CIA wasn't even formed until after the OSS, after that crash. Right. You know what I mean? So this is really when things start getting a, a deep state, if you will, um, to where even, you know, um, Truman, you know, kind of glinted to JFK and even his predecessor, predecessor um, you know, Dwight D. Eisenhower, that, you know, just, you know, beware. Like uh, you you mentioned it. I love that uh, that famous speech that... Uh, yeah, about the military-industrial complex. Yeah, beware of the uh, military-industrial complex and, and how big they're getting and the control that they want. You so know? prophetic. It was prophetic, you yeah. know. And, th- and there's there's linkage to... Uh, to um, to JFK kind of having those same reservations and wanting to disclose to the people, um, you know, what he knew about, you know, quote unquote, the alien presence here in America. And uh, yeah, that gets a little dark and ominous. Yeah, some of that stuff gets a little into uh, but Alex a, Jones territory, but... Yeah, not some of it, but then there's also some... I don't think some... JFK was killed because of UFO stuff yeah but no. that's like that whole isn't that uh, no well here's one for- unacknowledged that whole documentary sure that. now I'm how like, about this okay how about this one <laughs> have you ever heard of the nixon time capsule uh I have yes not. okay all right so we got a split room here apparently richard nixon wanted to be the president who disclosed et he wanted to be the disclosure president that would have been such a bummer if, yeah if like 
<laughs> like, like that would be like if Trump finally was like, "I'm the one who's letting you know all the secrets." It's yeah, like, great, we get all the secrets, but it's always forever because of this guy. No, well, that's what it, that's what his uh, his top intelligence aides had told him. They were really like, "If listen, if you want to be remembered in posterity, you could be the disclosure president." Uh, so much. I'm the disclosure. I want to dis- I want to disclose. How do we? When do we do it? Get Kissinger on the phone. Um, I want you to do a one man show. Yeah, one man <laughs> so uh so apparently so much so that he, he he had a documentary made by a guy named bob emenager now bob emenager is a famed uh filmmaker and documentarian and he comes he gets a meeting to the white house and he's like what am i here for fellas and they're like we want you to do a documentary on ufos and he bob en- emenager is kind of blown away he's like what he has like no interest or in the subject or no really foreknowledge about it and he's like and it's going to culminate with actual video footage of landing at holloman air force base where we meet the et and uh so bob emenager apparently was going to be given Could you imagine if you called in that meeting you're just yeah like, <clears throat> yeah uh what yeah no what and he's like he's they're like that's going to be the coup d'etat we will give you for the for the for the grand finale of your documentary actual film footage of the supported alien meeting that took place at holloman air force between Base. the aliens and truman between aliens and, and harry s truman that's right um now bob emenager goes on to create this still a pretty uh recognized ufo documentary i think it was called ufos past present and future now it comes down to the last minute where he's like i mean it's done it's in the editing bay and they're just now he's just waiting to pop in the famed footage where he gets a call from a top secret intelligent agent who says you know no go it's not happening click and so you know he he never did get his his holloman air force footage i could um, make up a story like that <laughs> yeah well and then uh so that's that's that part of the story now no, but that's fascinating now so now on to the nixon time capsule okay um testimony claims nixon hid proof of et in a white house time capsule um so I think this is great. Nixon time capsule will reveal the existence of extraterrestrials. A Houston plan informer revealed that President Nixon hid a time capsule in the White House that contains an explosive spreading about ETs. Now, this comes from uh, an episode of Dark Journalist. Have you ever watched Dark Journalist? I have not. And I'm, I sound, okay. I, it, it's by the great. sound of my voice, you can tell I'm scared. Well, of it's it. a video <laughs> series by Daniel List, who's an independent reporter. Mm-hmm. Now, I, 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 apparently, as it goes, um, let's see. Okay. Uh, so a guy named... Uh, We're just actually watching Bryce surf the internet right now. <laughs> this is just him going well, down a Google rabbit hole. That's all this presentation is. Bryce's with rabbit voices. hole. With voices, yes, with voices. Uh, like, a, a guy named Robert... And then I look Merritt. at the screens, this computer's not even on. <laughs> He's just typing. <laughs> oh, geez. I know. I want, how do I get this one right? Uh, um, there's a screensaver of a mermaid on here. <laughs> Yeah, so apparently he meets, uh, okay, where were we? Time capsule, right. In what appears to be a startling new twist, a guy named Robert Merritt reveals to List that he met three times with President Nixon in a deep underground location beneath the White House. In the first, Nixon... This is my man cave. I want to meet downstairs again. Uh, Three times. Nixon read him a letter stating that the U.S. was, and I love this word, protecting an extraterrestrial being, and that the scientists at Los Alamos were able to communicate with it and obtain advanced technology and science. Nixon then sealed the letter in a time capsule that he hid somewhere in the White House. In another meeting, Merritt says Nixon told him to deliver a copy of the letter, which Nixon allegedly taped to Merritt's stomach, to National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger. It goes on your tummy. <laughs> Give this to Henry. I want it on meeting. your tongue. Keep it cool. I don't want it to sweat off. <laughs> now go give this to Henry and don't tell anyone. Now, Merritt says co-author Douglas Caddy, who was a lawyer, one of the pre- premier lawyers of Watergate, has notified the National Archive. And I read this letter that he wrote to the archive. 
that Nixon's so-called time capsule is still in the White House and he, uh, Caddy, and will reveal the location if the National Archive agrees, agrees to read the letter to the public. So apparently Caddy writes this, uh, who, who's a prominent Washington lawyer is on the Beltway. Caddy, who's Caddy? Caddy was. Uh, is it an uh, actual cat? No, no, no. His talk? name is his name is Caddy. Oh, what's his first name? He was one of the premier lawyers handling oh, okay. Watergate. So um, he's vetted and he's got quite an illustrious career. Um, so not a cat. No, not a cat. <laughs> so far, I have not seen um, the proof. <laughs> yeah. So he writes this letter to the National Archives, basically saying, you know, me and me and this guy Robert Merritt, we want to get a group together, and he'll he'll show you where the time capsule is now. If it's still there. It has to be read aloud to all of us, uh, in, you know, in front of us. This guy sounds like the Riddler. And then I know <laughs> He's like making really odd does. demands. Well, Robert, he was a dark. Uh, he was a dark government informant, you know. Um, uh, anyway, so and that's the story of. Uh, there's more to it, but uh, for for those who want more, I recommend. I always going... love it when you give up on a story in the third act. <laughs> you think it's just listen? Dope? I was in Palm Springs over the last two week, two days. I didn't have a lot of time to do my own, so this is a little helter skelter. No, we got a great window into the way. Um, I think brain. he's just still hiding yeah, it on his tummy. I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> it's just. Still we, need on go plain the, sight. we need to go. We need to go look under every tummy. president's shirt. Yeah, see what they're hiding. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I found that one pretty fascinating because I can imagine yeah, him wild. like it seemed very Nixon esque. Like totally. you know, I'm going to put something in in a capsule, blow their fucking minds, <laughs> teach, <laughs> teach them to mess with old Dick. You know, uh, take this, <laughs> dude. Bryce's oh presidential God. encounters. I'm telling this you, one man off Broadway show. New Patreon uh, uh, series. I love it, Bryce. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, my um, pleasure. Super fun. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have uh, our second story of high strangeness involving a U.S. president. Can't wait. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Bryce Johnson from Bigfoot Collectors Club. Listen, if you have a paranormal story, we want to hear it. Write to BigfootCollectorsClub at gmail.com with your paranormal encounter, and we just might read it on a future episode. <laughs> And we're back, and what was supposed to be a mini episode is turning into a book length epic. It's our Fourth of July special here, and it's my turn to go up. And I brought in for you guys the story of Teddy Roosevelt and Bauman's Goblin. Yes, this is just one story. Uh, this we mentioned. Um, uh, well, I'll just go into it. Theodore Roosevelt wrote about a Bigfoot encounter in his book, The Wilderness Hunter. Now, we mentioned briefly back in episodes, uh, this back in episode six with Tim Bat and Guy Montgomery, but Roosevelt was a big time hunter and conservationist. And back in the day when America's West was still filled with mystery, or even more so than today. Now, while the former president didn't encounter Sasquatch himself, Bigfoot does seem to get a big endorsement from old Teddy long before he reached mainstream popularity. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a story that when I... Uh, at first, I thought it was just going to be one, like you, Bryce, I was going to do one of many. Uh, and then when I started to research this story and then actually read the passage from Roosevelt's book, I was like, this, this is all I want to focus on because it's awesome. It has all the telltale... A uh, Bigfoot story, like all of it's in all of it's in this story. You'll see. Yeah, it's pretty spellbinding. I, th I think you're gonna like this one. Okay, published before his term as president in 1892, the Wilderness Hunter is a collection of stories about Roosevelt's experiences as a frontiersman, hunter, and naturalist. Sasquatch enters the book during one chapter where Roosevelt writes about a goblin that attacked a trapper and fellow hunter by the name of Bauman, who later shared the story with Teddy. Now, according to Bauman uh, via Roosevelt, the trapper, and, uh, the, the trapper and a colleague were on a trapping expedition when Bauman was still a young man. Having no luck on their quest, the two trappers decided to try their luck up the mountains near the Wisdom River, uh, and I 
put an antidote in here to say exactly where this mountain range was, and I forgot to do that. So <laughs> apologies. We'll look that up momentarily. All good. Near an isolated pass with a creek where many beavers were said to make their habitat. Now, apparently, this area of the mountain range they were in had a bad reputation. A hunter had been found torn apart and half eaten by some kind of wild animal by mining prospectors just a year prior to Bauman's expedition. Nevertheless, Bauman and his partners set up camp and journeyed upstream to set some beaver traps. And when they returned from their adventure, they found that their campsite had been ransacked and their lean-to destroyed. Now, the first they thought, perhaps a bear. The beast had left tracks all over the place uh, but when the men went to work rebuilding the camp, they uh, and the fire was lit, uh, Bauman's partner went about investigating those tracks, and that's when he went, uh, Bauman, this bear's been walking around on two feet. Mm. So upon further inspection, the two men couldn't be sure that the tracks were that of a bear or a human. It was growing very dark as well. They were looking at it by, like, firelight. So the men rolled up in their blankets and went to sleep in their restored lean-to. Now, as these types of stories go, the visitor returned that night, and Bauman and his partner awoke to discover some kind of large, hairy creature lumbering around the campsite in the darkness. The fire was out, so they couldn't see anything. They grabbed their rifles, and they fired at the beast, which vanished into the night. The next day... Portal vanished. The next day, the two men <laughs> stuck close together, and they went out to check the traps they had set upstream uh, the day before, uh, and they were empty. So this, this one of the other parts of the story was this is kind of a b- bummer expedition. They weren't getting what they wanted. They weren't mm. catching any beaver. So when they came back to the campsite, they found that the visitor had returned once again while they were gone and trashed it again. This time, the creature had uh, departed near a brook, leaving tracks in the mud that plainly showed that it did move on two legs. Wow. So we don't know by this. We don't know from the account uh, that's written whether the what the tracks looked like. But um, they definitely agreed, and Roosevelt says it was a two-legged beast. Yeah. And you have to remember that up until this point, there really aren't any mainstream Bigfoot or Sasquatch stories. No. There are. We could assume that Roosevelt, having been experienced as experienced as he was, and having that he may have heard stories of the Sasquatch or a wild men from natives, mm-hmm. but but there, there there weren't stories like this out there. This was like is 150 years before Patterson Gimlin. Oh yeah, 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 exactly. And again, you have to remember that these are like the or this is. The, this is published in 1892, but this probably took place at least 20 to 30 years prior to that. So we're talking Civil War, 1860s around then. Yeah. Maybe even earlier. Um, prospectors are out there, so this could be as early as the 1840s. Yeah. Um, so uh, that night, the second night, the two men built a roaring fire with thick logs so it wouldn't burn out and took turns guarding the camp, keeping watch. According to Roosevelt, around midnight, the creature came down the mountain uh, and lingered on the other side of the brook, snapping branches and making strange, threatening sounds. Wow. And this is in his account. I mean, this yeah. is Finding Bigfoot. I mean, this all is the like, telltales. This is, yeah, all telltale signs. But it did not enter the camp where the fire was lit. Fearing that the mysterious apex predator would not leave them alone, Bauman and his partner decided to gather what little they had caught in their traps and skedaddle. So they went back upstream again together, collecting the empty traps. And the entire morning, hearing snapping branches and what sounded like footsteps stalking them, they had a terrible sense the entire time of being watched. At this point in the story, Roosevelt stops to remark how absurd it was that these two men, experienced trappers who had encountered all manner of wild creatures in their adventures, would be so scared in the broad di- broad light of day. Mm-hmm. Something really strange must have been occurring to throw these two dudes off. Yeah. So around then, that was a quote, those two dudes, just kidding. Uh, around noon, the trappers were within a mile or two of their campsite, but there were still three beaver traps left to collect in a nearby pond. Bauman volunteered to collect those traps while his partner went back to pack up the campsite. 
When Bauman got to the traps, he discovered that three beavers had been caught and one of the traps had been broken free and pulled downstream to a nearby beaver's den. So it took Bauman a couple hours to kill, skin the beavers, prepare the skins, and then collect the traps and go get that lost trap. Um, So he was gone a lot longer than he he had planned to be. Um, It took him a couple hours, and finally he headed back to camp and was filled with a real sense of dread and sense of unease as he walked through the forest, which seemed to remind the hunter that he was simply a man passing through a primordial force. Mm. It was twilight by the time Bauman approached camp. His stomach dropped to see that the fire had gone out, just a thin plume of smoke twisting its last breath into the forest air. Near where the fire had died, he could see their packs neatly arranged, but the camp was eerily still. He stepped out into the glade and called out to his partner, and just as the last sounds of his voice had passed his lips, he spotted the body of his friend slumped against a pine trunk. Bauman dashed over. The body was still warm. His friend's neck had been snapped, and four fang marks had been bitten into this flesh in the neck. Mm but the creature had not eaten his partner. Bauman looked around and saw the tracks, which, quoting Roosevelt, seemed to tell the whole story. Apparently his partner had finished packing their things, lit a fire, and sat on broken log waiting for Bauman to return. His back towards the forest, their predator had snuck up behind Bauman's partner and twisted his neck, and it looked like the creature had toyed with the body, dragging and rolling it along before biting it and slumping it against a tree, as if the man had been a child's doll. Bauman was convinced that this killer was some sort of half-man, half-devil. He left everything but his rifle, and he ran down the mountain to the area where they had hitched their ponies a couple days before. And he took off. He left everything. And uh, later went on to tell Roosevelt this story. And Roosevelt was so enjoyed the story of Bauman's Goblin that he included it in his book, making it one of the first and perhaps only official acknowledgments of Sasquatch by a U.S. president. Mm -hmm. That's the story. That's incredible. I love that. It's crazy, right? Yeah, I love that. So spooky. <clears throat> and you know, I'm familiar I'm pretty familiar with uh with Roosevelt. He's one of my heroes and and you know, he wasn't one to embellish. You know what I mean? The guy lived a pretty vigorous life. He didn't need to. He didn't need to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um and, and if I'm familiar that with in, within that whole wilderness hunting book, there's no like embellishments in there it's like no this is caribou this is bear this is the only kind of yeah. tall tale or anything that could be considered a tall tale in the whole book it's pretty straightforward very conservative very manly obviously yeah. and, but uh this was the only kind of oddity in that in that whole book i mean man but when you hear those like the things like snapping the twigs and then like making the grunting Mm -hmm. sounds and you're just like Mm -hmm. god it's like so reminiscent of like the the bigfoot stories that we tell that take place you know today well clearly they went up someplace where that territory was already claimed Mm. by something yeah and they were not welcome there yeah and it is funny where how like if it had been a cougar or a bear they would have eaten or dragged away his friend's body. Right. And instead, he just killed it and I think probably bit it to attack it. I don't, you know, I said after he dragged the body, I don't know, maybe he twisted and bit at the same time. Uh, but yeah, it seemed to be sort of a get out of here attack. Have you guys ever heard of a Bigfoot story where someone actually died in the Well, the one only one yeah, that's a great point. The only one we have that could have been was the Dyatlov Pass incident. Yeah, that, that we talked that's about. That's right. The nine hikers in, uh, oh, right, in the Russian Russia. story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we have that, but a lot of times these stories involve, um, you know, like Albert Osman's story, which is pretty wild. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you the know, kidnapping, yeah, the kidnapping and stuff. But um, I don't know. I mean, maybe there are. Who knows? I mean, maybe those, maybe there are, and those people have not lived to tell the tale. Yeah, that certainly helped makes this story kind of stand apart from most of the other Mm -hmm. you know um bigfoot stories but you know if you if you go through some of like you know even the bigfoot accounts that you can find a lot of them on the internet or the bfro or stuff like that you'll see a lot of tales of aggressiveness you know what i mean well if you're an alpha male bigfoot and you've got he if he's got a family up that mountain 
and these two dudes, and this is a new thing, right, for mm-hmm. the Sasquatch to see a to see white men coming in with guns and beaver traps and taking what could be his food or stuff off his land. Yeah, he might be doing what any old you know. Uh, strong-willed American might do and protect his property, yeah. you know, and saw them as a threat. Wow. I also so, just kept picturing, like, uh, Bigfoot in a band just trashing hotel rooms. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> when you kept talking about trashing camps. Yeah, like, totally. I mean, because bear, like obviously bears do, <laughs> bears do that, but um, it just seemed to be that as this guy just came in and was sending a message, you know, he warned him a couple times. And they uh, didn't get out of there fast enough. That's true. Know? He did give fair warning. Yeah, yeah, like two nights of like, get out of here. Right. And then I think he finally, probably when he saw that guy build another fire, assumed that... Uh, that was the last fire! Yeah, that, yeah like, <laughs> well, you're not staying here another night. Totally. So. Great story. Yeah, that's um, legendary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome, guys. So that's our, that wraps up our... I think those vegan burgers are going to be yeah. ready soon. Yeah, okay. totally. So, you know, if you've seen something strange in the sky or if you've perhaps seen a hairy creature peeking through the trees, you know, know that you're not alone. Our, uh, you know, the, high, the, the person who holds the highest office in this land, they've also seen strange, weird things. Or written about them. Or written about them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much. We'll be back next week with another regular episode of the Bigfoot Collectors Club with a celebrity guest. Um, in the meantime, uh, I want to thank our producer, Riley Bray. You're welcome, Riley. Um, and I want to thank uh, Sun Eaters for our theme song from the song Come Alone, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. I want to thank my co-host, Bryce Johnson. Right back at you, buddy. And um, yeah, follow us on all the uh, all the stuff. We're out there. Find Find us Bigfoot Collectors Club on Instagram, on Facebook, um, and also on Twitter. And also, please do us a huge favor. Um, if you listen to us on iTunes, go to the iTunes page. Give us a re- review us. Give us a five-star rating. Um, uh, you know, it actually really, really helps get the show to more people. So if you're a fan, take five seconds. You don't even need to, like, log in or anything. You can just write one. You can make up a name for yourself and just say that you like the show and help us get the show to more people. We would... Really, really appreciate it on this Independence Day. Um, Be safe out there, guys. Have fun, and we will see you. Enjoy your holiday, and we will see you next week right here at the Big Book Collectors Club. Happy birthday, Marco. 